Hi, I'm Colton, and I'm with Lab Group uh, 6B, and we're doing Lab 7 this week, MTF measurement of a diffraction limited system. And we're going to talk to you first about Fresnel diffraction, which is part B of the lab. Fresnel diffraction is um, basically diffraction that causes constructive and deconstructive interference. And because of this interference, you can get special patterns when it's viewed on a screen or some other source or some other something else to look at it with. So we're first talking about interference. We know that in-phase radiators produce constructive interference, and we know that out-of-phase radiators produce constructive deconstructive interference. So if we can figure out if the waves of light are in-phase or out-of-phase, we can figure out what the Fresnel patterns will look like. Here's a, um, a, a sketch of what it'll look like. So we have a source here that is radiating out, outwards, and then you can see here that at point Q, the um, source is now being diffracted across the edge of the aperture and it comes back to point P where, where it, is interf where it um, interferes constructively and deconstructively. So we can figure out what the optical path difference here is by knowing what rho sub a squared is, which where rho sub a is the semi-diameter of the aperture and L is the, difference, the distance between the two. Since this is a collimated case, we can ignore Z1 and we can ignore L1 and Z1. So using this equation where the um, Fresnel number um, is plugged into to find Z2, we can, use, uh, we, we can show that the, for zero waves optical path difference, you'll have no interference and you'll just have a, a plain illuminated uh, surface. That corresponds to INSVEF equals zero. For INSVEF equals two, that corresponds to one wave of optical path difference. And you'll see that we'll get a nice little dark spot followed by a bright ring. For instance, F equals three is one and a half waves of optical path difference, and you're going to get a bright spot, a dark ring, and a bright spot. So plugging in these numbers, we can calculate what Z2 is. Next, we're going to show you how we actually, um, we'll show you our setup that we used to find the Fresnel diffraction, and Alex will show you the patterns that we, we discovered after putting the pinhole in the microscope position Z2 away. I'm Alex Marty with Colton Noble. I'm going to show you our setup really quickly. Uh, so we have our laser going through the beam expander, and uh, collimate of light reflecting off of this mirror. And now, this week, we have uh, this aperture here, and we've made it as small as we can. We measured it to be about 1.8 millimeters, and that's acting as our Fresnel diffraction uh, source. And so if we uh, come down here where our microscope is, and we turn off the light, we can see that right now we're at a position where we have a bright spot in the center. And if we move our microscope and our screen down the rail, uh, to about here, we get to a point where we have a dark spot in the center. All right, I'm going to talk about part C, where we, invest, or we investigated the best focus of the lens, as well as how uh, the distance between the plus and minus one orders uh, is changes as a function of p uh, aperture size. So right now, we're approximately at best focus, and if we move our microscope toward the lens, we eventually get to a spot where we see a black spot in the middle, and that's the minus one order. If we go back to best focus and keep going away from the lens, we get to another spot ah, where we have uh, a dark spot in the middle, and that's our plus one order. And we uh, find that distance, or those two microscope positions, and the, the uh, midpoint between them is the best focus of our lens. And we also plotted how the distance between the plus and minus one orders differs as uh, with the aperture size. Which like Alex said earlier, we made a plot, and as you can see, as the um, aperture size remains smaller, the distance between nf equals one and nf equals minus one um, gets larger. And as you can see, as we increase the aperture size, it asymptotically heads towards zero, which is what we expect if we had an infinite-sized aperture. So now we're at the last part of our experiment, where we actually um, are we placed a, a slit at the focus of the lens, which we're testing here, the test lens, and it's a 72 micron slit, and we calculated that by figuring out what the cutoff frequency was for this particular F number, which is dependent on the aperture size. It's also dependent on the focal length of the lens. And so we placed the slit at the focus, and we are now scanning it back and forth, which is going to change the intensity measurements over here at the um, silicon detector. And once we get these uh, measurements, we're going to go ahead and plot them as a function of the, the slit spacing, and we're going to find out um, where the highs and where the, the lows are at. All right, so here is our uh, data. Along the x-axis, we have the, uh, the slit location in millimeters, and along the, the y-axis, we have the, ener the power measurement in millivolts. And this is normalized with our dark reading taken into account, and it's normalized to our, our uh, smallest data value. 
and uh, we clearly see the uh, center the, uh, of our airy disc, and then a minimum, and then the, the, the first max, and then the second max. All right, so this week in lab, we looked at uh, diffraction theory and Huygens' principle using a, a, uh, a circular aperture diffraction. And uh, we also measured the MTF of our test lens using the uh, power versus uh, slit uh, position. And we're going to find our MTF using that data and the MATLAB program. And we're going to compare that to the data or the MTF that Code 5 gives us for this lens using data off the Newport website. That's it for Lab 7. Alex Marty and Colton Noble.